Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today is a very special episode that I'm really excited to share with you. I wanted to take you along the journey of how I started my brand, The Local Love Club, and explain to you sort of like from the ground up how it came to be and what the process has been like starting a brand, being a business owner among many other things, and also doing something I've never done before. So I, um, I had a really challenging upbringing. I was bullied really bad from the time I was, you know, in the third grade all the time, all the way till I was a senior in high school. And it was really dark and it was really hard and it went on for years and years and years. And I felt really unsafe and I really felt like I had nowhere to go. And um, not that that makes me an addict, but I did turn to drugs and alcohol at the time. And after having this experience of basically like having no friends and having nowhere to go, I met these girls who were older than me and cooler than me and prettier than me and they were much older than me. And introduced me to things that I probably wouldn't have seen otherwise. I say this all the time, like the bullying is not what makes me an addict, it's not what makes me an alcoholic, it just became the tool, you know, it just became the solution to the pain that I was in. And of course it, it nearly killed me as most of these stories, most of these stories don't end the way that mine have, you know. Um, I've actually lost a lot of people along the way. My best friend died two years ago of a drug overdose, alone in a hotel room with a needle in his arm. I really take this seriously and it is part of my path and it is part of my journey and it's not something that I shared publicly until about a year ago. I felt like I couldn't authentically share what the meaning of this brand was and why I was creating it with leaving out the part of my life that is so important to who I am and the woman that I've become essentially. You know, I couldn't talk about the bullying without talking about the fact that my solution to that was to numb the pain with drugs and alcohol. And so when I decided to launch this brand, I had you know, many conversations with family and agents and just like, are we doing this? Like, are we going all out? Like, are we really gonna share it all? And I, I chose to finally do that after 16 years. A few years ago, I went through a terribly sad breakup. It was like, it was one of those breakups that you're just like on the floor for a year. I didn't know I would, I would ever feel happy again. I realized in this breakup that I had spent so many years because of the bullying, like so closed off to people and so tough and so harsh and so unapproachable. And really what that breakup did was like crack me open to realize that I was just pushing people away for so long. And not only in this relationship, but the way that I interacted with people in my industry or people on the street for that matter. You know, I was not always kind, I was not always nice, and that was never about anyone else but myself. So for the last few years I've been doing all this work and people who really knew me, who really know me, have seen this enormous change in the person that I am and the person that I've become. And I'm really proud of that person and I'm really proud of that woman. It's not just about getting sober, right? It's like, how great can I be? Like, how loving can I be? And as I was going through this experience, as we all were with the pandemic of like, what do we wanna learn here? How do we wanna grow? How do we wanna change? At least for me, you know, I thought I, really have always wanted to do a clothing line. But if I were to do it, I, I mean, and I knew it had to be sweats. I knew it just had to be stuff that I wear that's authentic to me, that's authentic to my clients. And I really just wanted it to stand out. I wanted it to be different from every other streetwear brand that exists. And I wanted its story to be about my story. When I was creating this, I knew there had to be a charitable aspect to this, and I did all this research, and I found these two girls, Molly and Lauren, who started the Kind Campaign, and it's a program that goes into schools and directly combats the girl-on-girl -girl bullying that's been occurring within the school, and it heals what's already occurred. They just have the most incredible results, and I just knew I needed to help them any way that I could. So I donate a part of the proceeds to them. Then the journey of actually making clothes started. So in the middle of the pandemic, I was able to find some factories in LA that were working, thank God. In November, I started working directly with a friend of mine who owns a factory and we started to develop samples. I knew exactly what I wanted to make. I didn't obviously know exactly what I was getting myself into, but 
I knew I wanted to make sweatpants. It's the most important thing. The most important thing is the butt because the butt. even if it's unisex, it still has to make the butt look good for everybody. True. Yeah. So the butt looks fire. I knew it wanted to be, I wanted it to be unisex. I felt like all the years of shopping for clients, I was always buying sweatpants in the men's section. Our first round of samples were amazing. We spent months working on them. The fabric was amazing. It was exactly what I wanted. And then when it came time to actually making them, the prices were way too high for me to produce them at that factory, which was such a bummer. And because I was in such good hands with my friend who was doing it for me, I just truly couldn't afford to do it. This is a completely self-funded project. I have put every penny of my own money into this. There is no one else helping me in there hopefully never will be. We moved the production to another factory, which that in itself, for anyone who doesn't know, that can take months. So basically the new factory then has to redevelop the samples because they've never made the actual garment. So they need to figure out how to recreate the thing I wanna recreate. The other thing that happens a lot is there's like merch brands. So there's places you can go that this exists already and you just, put your graphic on the piece of clothing that already exists. That was not what I wanted to do. And so I decided to do everything cut and sew, which basically means this is completely, you know, top down design by me. I want to do this because it's like basics. We have our fit so dialed in, we have our fabric so dialed in. Like this is just about having like great, simple basic pieces that are still from us. But I feel like what needs to go to that company is still Thank you for being kind. Like something along those lines that's like, this is who we are as a brand. Do you know what I'm saying? It needs to have like, it has to have the brand message behind. I want the rib to look like this. I want it to be this width. I want the sleeve to do this. I want, okay. So it's every single detail is something that I, I wanted it to be. In the meantime, I'm like interviewing a million different graphic designers. I have all the ideas in my head. I obviously know what I want the stuff to say or what I want it to look like, but trying to convey that to another person <laughs> is not easy. I spent months, thousands and thousands of dollars with different graphic designers. Nothing was really hitting, nothing was really right. I had, I'd like something for a while and then we'd be like, ah, it's like not really it. Finally, my very, very good friend, Greg Yuna, was looking at the stuff and he's sitting next to his creative partner and assistant, Rachel Goatley, and he's like, let Rachel just take a stab at it. Like, let's just see what she can do. Two days later, I get a PDF from her and it's like, she literally went in my brain and explained I, I, my head exploded and I was like, thank God, you know, we got it. So when it finally came time to launch, everything went wrong. <laughs> no one knows that. The fulfillment center that I hired that I could afford, God bless them, ruined everything. I shouldn't say that. Okay. There's so many elements. There's a graphic designer. There's a factory who makes the clothes. Then there's another place the clothes have to go to get embroidered. Then after they're embroidered, they have to get finished, which means draw cords have to get inserted. The clothes get poly bagged. Then they get a scan and then they go to another place, which is a fulfillment center, which is a place that basically fulfills your order. You buy something online and then it comes to you. I anticipated this drop be being successful and knew that that was not something I could do on my own or that my office could do on our own. So we hired a fulfillment center. When the clothes went to get embroidered at the first place we tried to use, how do we even say this? Because we were trying to get the product out by a certain date, you know, we were like pretty dead set on it being dropped on a certain day. I didn't see the full, every single piece, obviously. It would be impossible to see, for my eyes, to see every single piece. So a couple friends had placed some personal orders. Everyone really wanted this beige hoodie. It had hearts embroidered on the hood. I send them, it's like to Rachel and Greg, and they receive them and there's no hearts on the hoods. And I realized that the embroidery company did not embroider the hearts onto any of the hoods. Simultaneously, I pull out a pair of pants. The tag was sewn in the wrong direction on the waistband, to which point the draw cords could not move. I obviously want this stuff to be perfect. There's nothing I wanted more than every single detail to be perfect. So I'm in the middle of this drop. 
I have to find a new fulfillment center. It basically sells out in the first day. Within the first week, it was pretty much all gone. It was like so successful and so amazing, but behind the scenes, there was so much happening. The day it came out, I mean, I was just like on cloud nine. I go to sleep, I wake up. For whatever reason, I think I was just like excited and nervous. I wake up at five o'clock in the morning and my social media manager is already on my phone saying we have a huge problem. And she sends me a link to something online from a guy claiming that I stole the name of his brand. Now, when you start a brand, the most important thing is obviously a name. A lot of the time, the hardest part is finding a name that's available in the trademark. And so the name came to me one day, like crystal clear. I searched the Instagram, the Instagram was available. I searched the website, the website was available. I searched the trademark, the trademark was available. So to wake up this next morning after I've launched what I consider to be like my child, Someone is on the internet claiming I stole the name and I stole the premise of his brand. Now in full transparency, I obviously had never come across this name or this brand. They don't have a trademark and they did not have a verified Instagram account. So I didn't know about them. And they were also in a completely different side of the world. So to wake up to this was the most devastating thing, I think to that point I'd ever gone through online. Had this person simply reached out to me and asked, we could have attempted to clear it up in a different way. Instead, they chose to go online and to ignite cancel culture and send thousands of messages to my page, to my brand's page, accusing us of stealing this concept. The irony of it all is I was bullied my entire life and I start a brand about bullying. For the first time in 16 years, I'm honest, I tell Vogue that I'm sober and that this is my journey and this is my story. I've never been so vulnerable and open with the world of like, this is me. You know, it's always been about like, I stand behind these clients, I'm a stylist, I work for them. This was the first time where it was like, this is Maeve, <laughs> you know? And within 12 hours of launching this brand, I'm being bullied and harassed. And I, I can't begin to explain the pain, the sadness, the tears, the literal meltdown that I had about it. The moral of the story is, there has been a million challenges that have come up with this brand. This is a story that I've never shared because I truly didn't want to give it weight. I didn't want to acknowledge it in any public capacity because I knew the truth. I knew that um, what I did was true and authentic and I knew that there was no truth to this um, you know, rumor or allegation or whatever you want to call it. But more importantly, it was even more clear what the mission was. You know, it was even more clear that we need to stand for love and kindness no matter what. That was the bottom line for me. You know, like I knew the truth, my people know the truth, the fans of my brand know the truth, and that's really all that matters. And I truly wish this other brand like so much love and success. Um, I really, really mean that. So it really hit me. I need to hire someone. I cannot do this on my own anymore. I'm obviously running my styling business and everything else that I'm doing. And this is taking up all my time. And I obviously want this stuff to be perfect. So cut to Kevin Van, everybody. I am so happy to introduce the man who saved my life and my brand's life, our amazing Kevin Van, our production manager slash solver of every problem. When I describe what I do to people, <laughs> it's just making stuff, which is exactly what it is. You know, it's like, this is more natural to me than a design room or yeah. an email or a spreadsheet. Like this is the most natural thing. This is my fabric? Yeah, that's your fabric. Oh, hi. We're gonna cut all of this stuff up for the holidays. Oh my God. So when it was time to launch and announce the project, Vogue wanted to be the ones to do that for me, which is, I mean, such an honor. It was my biggest goal, obviously, to be acknowledged by such a company as Vogue. And all the years that I had been working with them, obviously talking about my clients or my looks, there was no better place 
for it to happen than there. The fabric comes from somewhere else, we buy it somewhere over there, then it gets delivered here. So this is all of our fabric coming in right here. Um, it comes in white. Normally it comes in undyed like this color right here. The cutters and sewers here will turn this fabric into garments, which will go to a dye house afterwards where they decide to dye it green or blue or black or whatever it is, but most everything comes in undyed like this. So this is the big blueprint. So when we go to cut a style, they'll roll out the fabric like this and they'll lay the pattern over it by size. So each one of these blocks of paper is a size. And then they'll stack the, the fabric up like this high and just cut all the pieces like that into big old chunks and then that goes over the sewing line over there. Each one of these machines is set up for a specific operation. So every time it gets passed from machine to machine, everyone's just really focusing on one of the operations. Such as like neckline, Neckline, sleeve. like right here, they're sewing the sides up and he's doing it really quickly because, and that's the way you get that sort of efficiency is he's been trained on that specific operation and he can do it like it's, you know, with his eyes closed essentially. And then you have a couple of people who are the floor managers here. So they're going from station to station, checking the QC as the product moves along. So their job, they know every single process themselves internally. So they manage the line, different parts of the line. If something gets rejected, they're the first ones to see it and pull it out, have it redone, whatever it is. I agree. It stretches a little bit. And I like see how you can like see, I don't like that really. I know it's the tiniest thing no, ever. No, no, but it's but and like Greg put it on the other day and he was like budgeting to like cover his t-shirt underneath it, you know? And like, I don't wanna, but also it grows because the fabric is so soft. Yeah. So we're gonna have to do a sample and close it up. I would, I would think an inch or more, but what we want- But wanted, that basically means we have to make a new pattern, yeah. right? It's a pattern adjustment. I mean, it's- yeah, How much is that gonna cost me? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But these things do cost money. So yeah. you gotta ask, you know? It's like, is it worth it? But to me, everything is worth it because I'm a crazy perfectionist. And I know when I'm shopping for clients and I'm like, oh, the neck isn't quite, I just want it to be perfect, so. Obviously, I'm new here on YouTube and I really wanted to share my story and what this brand is about. So obviously, if you're interested, go check us out at thelocalloveclub.com. And don't forget, a part of our proceeds go to the Kind Campaign, which is also linked in this video. Like and subscribe. <laughs>